The exact amount of greenhouse gas removal we're going to need globally depends, of course, on how successful we are in reducing emissions. But if you look at the kind of pathways that come from the best scientific evidence to meet our global climate targets, then alongside cutting emissions very rapidly, we're probably going to need greenhouse gas removal at the scale of billions of tonnes per year by the middle of the century. Here in the UK, we've got a legally binding target to get down to net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. And the government publishes a strategy for getting there that already involves several greenhouse gas removal methods. That includes 30,000 hectares per year of tree planting. Up in Scotland, there's a target of restoring about 250,000 hectares of degraded peatlands over this decade. And actually, there's also now a target to scale some of these newer greenhouse gas removal methods up to 5 million tonnes of removals by 2030. The Greenhouse Gas Removal Demonstrators Programme in the UK is a publicly funded research project by UK Research and Innovation. It's a five-year programme that includes the core project I'm in, as well as five different demonstration projects, each trialling different greenhouse gas removal methods in various places around the UK. And the main aims of the programme are to scale these methods more effectively so that we can achieve our national net zero target here in the UK, but also for the UK to play its wider role in global climate solutions to achieve our global climate goals. The programme includes biochar, enhanced rock weathering, uh, perennial biomass crops, uh, woodland creation and peatland restoration as five different ways of removing greenhouse gases from the atmosphere. And then there's also the core hub, which does a lot of interdisciplinary research and engagement across the piece. Biochar, which is it's essentially anthropogenic charcoal. So uh, we take biomass, we heat it to very high temperatures under low oxygen conditions, and that creates like a charcoal. And that's a very stable form of carbon. So in this case, we're looking at putting it in agricultural soils. And that carbon is then stored for long periods of time, somewhere between 100 or 1,000 years, uh, potentially longer. Enhanced rock weathering is a very straightforward, simple technology. You basically take ground up rocks, silicate rocks, and you apply them to the fields. And then the rainwater and the acidic environment within the soils breaks those rocks down. They undergo what we call chemical weathering. And that captures carbon dioxide. And, uh, and then you reapply the following year. So it's a very, you know, it's a very straightforward process. In recent decades, biomass became of interest as a renewable energy to, in effect, replace fossil fuels that, that actually replaced them several centuries before. The key bit, really, in terms of uh, for this particular set of demonstrators is the fact that if we've got fast-growing plants like miscanthus, like short-rotation coppice willow, you have a lot of photosynthesis, a lot of carbon gets drawn down, that gets harvested, we generate energy from that, importantly, we combine that with carbon capture and storage, and so we get this negative em emission technology, so greenhouse gas removal, which is what the set of demonstrators are all about. So, peat, it's our most carbon-rich um, store in the biosphere, really. I mean, it's a slow but steady process so over thousands of years quite a significant amount of carbon that would otherwise have been in the atmosphere is now locked up in peatlands all over the world. It's, it's like a third of all soil carbon or more is, is stored, so more than in all the trees in the world is stored in peat. And that's a lot of carbon in summary. Um, and it'll stay that way and it'll keep growing as long as it stays wet. But of course a lot of peat in the UK hasn't stayed wet because of drainage for agriculture and, and forestry and, and other things. It means that something like 4% of the UK's greenhouse gas emissions, we think, are coming from the decomposition of peat, so where we've exposed all that organic matter to, to oxygen through drainage across large areas. Um, so at the moment, peat's kind of part of the problem. <laughs> um, but really what we're looking at is whether it could become part of the solution.
Government has committed to hit net zero emissions of carbon by 2050 and trees are important for that because they directly remove carbon from the atmosphere as they grow and they're actually also very very good at it. But there's a much more fundamental drive behind this project and that's trying to change the way that we make decisions about the land and the environment in general. The problem that we have is what I call single focus decision making. Unfortunately, because of this single focus, we make a decision only looking at the outcome that we are interested in, but in the real world, loads of other things happen as well. So what this project tries to do is to capture all of those interrelated effects and present it to decision makers in a really simple to use form. Once you bring these different disciplines together, you find that you can answer questions that could never be answered by any one of those disciplines uh, working individually. And that's really important in this century. The Core Hub is a collaboration led out of the Smith School of Enterprise and Environment at the University of Oxford with six other universities involved as well. And we're there as a research and engagement hub for greenhouse gas removal in the UK. So we work very closely with the five demonstration projects on cross-cutting issues. We have three main aims in core. Number one is to create a portfolio of options that decision makers in government and elsewhere can use to help stimulate greenhouse gas removal. Number two is actually to evaluate projects and help them scale, help the successful ones to scale rapidly. And number three is actually to build a research and expert community across the UK in greenhouse gas removal, skilled people who are well connected. In order for these different methods to actually scale successfully, there's a number of things that they need to achieve or overcome, and we're looking across the piece at these. We need to actually know that they remove greenhouse gases from the atmosphere successfully. We want to know how much they can remove, how quickly, how effectively, any other emissions involved in the, in the processes of doing this. We want to know about their wider environmental and social impacts. What are the impacts on water quality, on soil quality, on air quality, for instance? There are really important social questions about what people like land to be used for, what kind of jobs they want, which kind of techniques they prefer more or less. There's a really important role for thinking about the legal environment around these things. What's been allowed to do, what's encouraged by governments and regulators, what is discouraged. How do these things fit within our overall industrial and land systems? What are the methods which are going to really align to what we're doing and therefore scale well? Which ones need new processes and techniques which might need a bit of an adjustment? the business model. So if we want people to be doing these things at scale, how are they going to make a viable living from this? So actually getting rewards to people who can do genuinely effective and worthwhile carbon removal is a key piece of this puzzle. And finally, cutting through all of these things really, is how well we can monitor and measure these methods. A lot of them are very new. We don't actually have agreed processes for measuring how much carbon comes out and where it gets stored and what the wider issues are. We need to make sure that we're not actually damaging the environment by trying to fix it. So we need to make sure that all these methods really deliver co-benefits in terms of soil, water and air, as well as carbon. This is pioneering research. The demonstrators are trialling these methods in the real world and we're getting really rich information which we can feed back into our tools, our computational models, artificial intelligence approaches to provide better data and better information. One of the key things we're doing in the core hub is to develop a toolkit uh, to help us evaluate different GGR methods using a set of standardised scientific criteria. The principles offer that harmonised view both on methods and data which apply across all GGRs so then you are able to actually compare a tonne of CO2 removed by biochar application to a tonne of CO2 removed by direct air capture with geological storage. There are so many questions right now. 
Monitoring, reporting and verification is really a key part at evaluating GGRs because it might be that right now a GGR in, the, in, in a given small supply chain works really well and delivers removals and delivers other co-products and is sustainable. However, as it grows, it scales up, it might be that some circumstances changes, so the removal capacity can change, uh, the co-benefits might turn on to be actually trade-offs and affecting negatively the, the environment and the um, social setting around the GGRs. So MRV is really key to inform at all time how is that GGR project performing by having clear accounting methods and clear and robust data to underpin those methods, we will actually reduce the noise which is currently out there and the uncertainty related to, to removals and to the carbon markets. Different type of stakeholders can use this kind of qualitative and quantitative data in different ways. For example, for the government, they can decide what type of GGR to scale up where and when, depending on the trade-offs and core benefits, for example. Then the investors, of course, they will need to know what are the trade-offs, uh, how safe their investment is. Uh, the wider public and the ENGOs, of course, uh, might find our principles very uh, useful because they are a comprehensive set of key points which you need to look at when assessing and appraising GGRs. And they are continuously evolving, so members of the public and ENGOs, any other stakeholder can actually feed back to us and improve this as, as we go. If you want GGRs to be a large-scale part of the solution to climate change, they need to be financed and funded, it needs to be a large industrial sector, and that means that you need to have legal structures in place which allow industry and finance to come in, build those uh, sectors, and you know, make a profit out of it so that it becomes a commercial activity uh, for a beneficial purpose. And part of that is that you need to have a system for certifying the removals that you make uh, so that purchasers of those um, credits are confident that they really took place, that they are genuine, that they will be durable in some sense um, so that they can be sold and resold. So that certification process um, is something that we spend a lot of time looking at. The programme has a wide-ranging set of contacts with policymakers who are thinking about how they can regulate this space in a way that not only is it environmentally sound, but also that, so that it's socially robust, so that the people or communities who live proximate to these uh, sites feel that they're not being taken advantage of, that this is an industry which is beneficial to them, that there are long-term sustainable jobs which are, are of benefit to the community and so on. So that social robustness piece, um, ensuring that publics are fully part of are full and equal participants in the uh, sector is also um, a significant element of our work. So the work CORE is doing is very important because we're really trying to understand, you know, how could we take these technologies to scale in a way that's energy efficient, in a way that's ethical, in a way that supports biodiversity, in a way that doesn't compromise our environment goals or our other sustainable development goals. What's the point of a cooler planet if it's uninhabitable? Um, and so it's really important that we don't focus on the cooling technologies and in so doing, forget to look after the biosphere. So we really need to get that right and there's huge areas of uncertainty around this and what CORE is doing um, are bringing together you know, knowledge from experiments and observational studies across the different demonstrators is really trying to get to the bottom of that. How could this be scaled? Um, what are the blockers, societal, financial or legal? What are the environmental constraints? How do we have this GGR technology embedded within these flourishing healthy landscapes? Um, and how do we meet both our climate change mitigation goals whilst also supporting biodiversity and reducing poverty and inequality. 
I think the really special thing about the Greenhouse Gas Removal Demonstrators program is that we are taking concepts which up until now have been in scientific models and in scientific papers and we're actually trying them in the real world, in real world landscapes with real people. We're discovering the challenges and the opportunities and we're learning getting a much richer picture about how to scale these and how to scale them well. And I think what we're finding is that all of them can make a contribution. There's no one silver bullet to fix this problem. But a lot of them are going to be especially well suited in particular contexts, particular locations with particular people and skills. And so I think it makes a lot of sense to be pursuing a range of options, have a portfolio, if you will, in order to try and get to the amount of removals in total that we're going to need.